Hello, I'm David Ellenstein, Artistic Director at North Coast Repertory Theater. Thank you for joining us today for Theater Conversations. If you enjoy watching these, please click like, subscribe, and share. It's free to do, and it helps us get more visibility for these videos. Thank you. Hello, and thanks for joining us for Theater Conversations. It's my great pleasure today to be joined by an old friend and an amazing actor, Patrick Page. Hey, Patrick. Hey, how are you? I'm well, how are you? I'm great, thank you. Good. So most of these interviews I've done have been with people that my North Coast audience knows already. But um, I just thought it's, it's now a time and important for me to bring in people that they should know. And as far as I'm concerned, you're somebody that they should know. They may know you from the Globe, if they went, if they, uh, went to the Globe and saw Cyrano de Bergerac, or they saw you play Malvolio in Twelfth Night, or so many other plays that you've done, I know, at the Globe. Mm -hmm. And also, a lot of my people go to New York. And if they go to New York and they go to Broadway, they could have seen you play Hades in Hadestown, or Scar in Lion King, or Lumiere in Beauty and the Beast, or what am I for? I'm forgetting Spider Man. You played Green Goblin, right? Yeah. And there's another, are, big one. there's another big one I'm forgetting. What am I forgetting? Oh, there. Are, I, I've done 15 Broadway shows. So um, some of my favorites are uh, uh, Casa Valentina, um, Harvey Firestein's play. I played Valentina in that. And I recently played, most recently, I played The Inquisitor in St. Joan opposite Condola Rashad. So those are all real fun things. And, and I love playing uh, King Henry in Man for All Seasons opposite Frank Langella. And you know, if you're, if you're in, the, in, the, in the area where you are, I, I played Frollo in The Hunchback of Notre Dame at uh, La Jolla Playhouse, which I also played we go. over here on the East Coast. Wow, wow. So, you know, the audience is gonna be very impressed by those credits. But see, I think of you from your younger career where you were a major Shakespearean actor in this country at the big Shakespeare festivals. You were many, many years at Utah and many, many years at Ashland, and you played great roles at all those places. When you think back on those, because we'll get to the Broadway stuff in a minute, but when you think back on those, what, which couple of them come to your mind and you go, That's, that was the best? Well, I mean, in, in terms of regional productions of classical plays, I really, my favorite really is that production of Cyrano de Bergerac we did at the Globe that Darko Treshnik directed. But in terms of like uh, Shakespeare performances, we did, I did a Richard III in Salt Lake City that I, that I loved a lot because we kind of found an, an interesting way into it. Um, and I loved playing Mark Antony and Ashland because it was in the outdoor space and the director had chosen to kind of make the, the audience in the Elizabethan theater there, the, the Roman mob. So I got to sort of do Mark Antony's great speech directly to that, to that you know, wonderful 1200 strong audience there in the Elizabethan theater. So, and, and in, in Cedar City, Utah, I, I loved my time there because I was there for six years and I really learned so much about how to act there. And, and I think some things I learned about how not to act um, because whenever you have an audience that knows you and, and, um, and kind of has ownership and loves you they will encourage your 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 worst habits right because they're on vacation and they want to laugh and then so the the potential to play sort of dishonestly and kind of push toward a laugh is very strong in that kind of environment in Ashland or in Utah but also I learned a lot about relationship to audience because the audience is visible for at least the first hour of the play and I happen to play a lot of roles that soliloquize, and, and when you soliloquize in Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare always has the character speaking this soliloquy, speaking directly to the audience. Um, and so I think I created in my mind this kind of relationship with an audience that now I carry into 
my other work where I'm, I'm, I'm very aware of their presence. Even if I'm doing a play where uh, the fourth wall is, is very strong, I'm, I'm very aware that there are people just on the other side of it listening in. And so I think that gives me, I hope it gives me a kind of generosity toward the audience in terms of how I share with them as opposed to keeping my work just to myself or just to my fellow players. Well, you make me think of something because here we are at a time where we can't have an audience. Right. And so much of live theater has to do with our gathering together and sharing with an, a live audience. Can you talk about what is so special about that? I mean, I know you've done a fair amount of film and television work as well, but what's different about doing theater? Why does it still matter and why is, what, what makes it so special for you? Well, theater in terms of our art form is the, is the live event, right? It's, and people need live events. There's a, there's a spiritual component to a live event that doesn't exist in a in a filmed event um i think it's why people are so attracted to sports you know you'll see a, a sports arena i'm, I'm such a I, i'm such a numbskull about sports that i don't know how many of the biggest arenas hold but you know 20 30 40 50 000 people i don't know how many they hold but how are you going to fill that well you fill that with the possibility of surprise um, and that's why we come into those arenas is the possibility that we may be surprised that we don't know the outcome. And so in the theater, I believe the same possibility exists when it's live, the possibility of surprise. And in my own work, I try to make sure that that possibility is always present present, that I don't know what's going to happen when I go on stage. Therefore, the audience can't know what's going to happen when I go on stage. And if you were to come and see the play on any two or three given nights, you'd see different performances. So that's live theater, you know. That's why you can't take your, you know, there's a famous saying that we have as actors that you're never supposed to act with, um, with animals or children. And it's a funny line, but it's true because the fact is the audience, if, if the child is, is a real child, let's say a toddler under three years old, and the, and the animal is a real animal and not some animal that's been trained to behave in a certain way on the stage, then what the child or the animal brings into the event is the possibility that something unforeseen may happen. And that's why the audience can't take their eyes off of them. So the great actors like Brando and Rylance are actors that have that quality, uh, the quality of a, of a toddler or of an animal where you, the audience is made to understand that you don't actually know what's going to happen next. Right, that, that element of surprise, you're, you're so right about that. So you make me think for a second about how we met and we first met doing a production of Dracula at the Arizona Theater Company, and I don't want to say how many years ago. I don't even know how many years ago. You both feel really old if I say it. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> anyway, uh, you were Dracula, and I was Harker, and you're talking about that element. I'm just remembering we moved the, the show from Tucson up to Phoenix to do it at the Herberger Theater, and uh, Harker is in the asylum after Dracula has tortured him, and we used to come up... Um, uh, Mina, Brit, who played Mina, and I would come up on this hydraulic uh, and to the floor level. And at first preview, I don't know whether you remember, we had to stop and the loudspeaker stage manager said, get off the hydraulic. Oh. And we had to like get off in the middle of the show, get off because the cable had broken and they were manually holding it up. Oh my goodness. Uh, no, I don't like, remember that. Right. So uh, it was it, closest thing to a big accident I've ever had working in the theater, but I'm, I, it makes me think, you've done some big Broadway extravaganzas, mm -hmm. including things with major special effects. Yeah. Can you talk about some of those bizarre experiences? Like I'm thinking, I know Spider-Man had, there were lots of stories about what went on during rehearsal and so on. Is there something that stands out to you as kind of like an amazing theater story that you can share? Well, Spider-Man, 
for those people who, who have either forgotten or, or didn't follow it at the time, you know, we, we kept ex- putting off the opening date. It was, the, it was the largest and most expensive show ever done on Broadway. The music was done by Bono and the Edge, and it was directed by Julie Taymor. And I was playing um, Dr. Norman Osborne, who becomes the Green Goblin, who's the villain of the piece. And because they kept putting off the opening, and they put it off for months, actually. So we'd been in previews. Uh, we started previews in November. And then we were supposed to open in December, and they put it off until January. Then they put it off again until February. Then they put it off again until March. And eventually the critics said, some of the major critics said, we're not going to wait anymore. And we're going to come to one of the previously announced opening nights. I think it was one in March. I can't remember for sure. Anyway, they were in the audience on this night. And on the night that the critics were in the audience, the critic of the New York Times, at least, was in the audience, we got to the final scene where... Um, the it was going to be enormous, uh, you know, aerial battle between the Green Goblin and Spider Man, and the actor playing Spider Man and I had, were facing off, just about to begin this battle, and uh, th- that actor was Reeve Carney, who's my dear friend, who I now play opposite in Hades Town, and the voice came over the loudspeaker. Hold, please, hold, please. We have a technical difficulty. At that moment, with the critics in the house. And I said something like, oh, that, you know, in the goblin voice, that takes the villainy right out of you. And then uh, uh, Reeve and I began to improvise. But Reeve wasn't, at that time, terribly comfortable with improvisation in character. He really liked to have a script. And so he went over, there was a piano on stage that I was eventually going to throw over the edge of the Chrysler building. And uh, I know it sounds exactly like what it was. And um, he went there. I had a bottle of champagne and a glass of champagne over on the, on the piano. So he went over there and he began to drink the champagne because he wanted an excuse not to talk. And I said, as the goblin, I said, you better be careful there, boy. You're going to be flying in a minute. And I hear they dropped a few. And it brought the house down. (laughs) And it was like you'd unleashed, uh, you know, a stampede, the the sound that came from the audience at that point. And the next day when the critic from the New York Times, Ben Brantley, released his review, of course, he led with that moment. (laughs) as a way of saying something about what we just talked about, that something real happened during the the show, which was massively entertaining, and comparing that to that which was not as real and not as entertaining. It was not a favorable review of the show. So you you were doing Hades Town when the pandemic closed everything down, is that correct? Yes, yes. So what was that like? And what have you been doing to keep your spirits up and to stay busy? And it's been what six almost? Has it been six months now? Oh, more than now. more than six, yeah. It's we we closed around the Ides of March. Yeah. Um, well, I actually had been given a heads up by my doctor. He had actually told me on January twenty fifth, this is coming. So when people talk about how. Um, politicians didn't know about it. My doctor had gotten a heads up from the CDC and I happened to be sitting in his office with him when he got the alert on his phone. And that was January 25th. Wow. And so I had, and he said to me at that time, he said, go home, stock up on groceries, get at least two weeks of groceries, two weeks of water. If you can leave the city, leave the city. And I thought maybe he's a crazy conspiracy nut because at the time there was nothing like that in the news. Right. And, but I did tell my partner in the show, Amber Gray, who plays Persephone, I told her, I said, look, look, for whatever it's worth, this is what my doctor told me. And I told my friend Reeve. And then I said, you know what? If you should bring anything that you have in your dressing room, 
that you can't do without or that you really love or want home because I think there's a possibility we're going to be locked out of the theater because that's happened to me before in strike situations. Um, when the building is closed, it doesn't matter. You can't get back in and actors tend to keep things that are very dear to them in, in the dressing room. So I had a couple of things in there that were quite dear to me and that I needed and I brought them home. And sure enough, uh, one day, it wasn't the next day, but a, a week or two later, I, I, I don't actually remember the day. Um, they said, you know, don't come into work tonight. Everything is shutting down. Of right. course, theaters were the first things to be shut down. Yeah. That was shut down by the state of New York at the time. Um, and the producers actually had to wait for the governor. I, I had talked to my producers and said, you know, I don't know that if we should be in here. And the cast had gathered and we had had a meeting um, and we were all talking about whether or not we should actually be there. But the producers had to wait until the governor gave the signal. Otherwise the insurance didn't kick in. Uh, so, um, so we had to wait, but uh, it was okay. Funny what dictates our lives. So what have you been doing for six months? I have been so busy. It's That's crazy. Great. Uh, I great. mean, uh, you know, kind people like yourself ask me to do things like this. I have my own podcast, which I do once a week. I have a film that I'm shooting this week, and then I have a different film that I'm shooting next week. I'm shooting a series for HBO. Um, and, um, and then just, you know, dozens of these kind of Zoom. I did a marvelous Zoom production of Macbeth for uh, something called Plays in the House, uh, where I felt in some ways I got closer to the characters. It's the fourth time I played him, but I, in a way I felt I got closer than I had before because I, I, there was no need to project anything. You know, it yeah. was just this, just my head in the screen. Right. And so that was wonderful freedom with that particular play. And, and then my own one man show, which is called All the Devils Are Here, How Shakespeare Invented the Villain, uh, I, I'm doing sometimes online for people. I did it last week live in Virginia for a socially distanced group for the Shakespeare Theater in DC. And then I'm filming it for the Shakespeare Theater in DC for their full season next month. And then I'll be coming to Arizona with it in November as well. So I, I've been, I've been busier than I've ever been. Uh, the wow. thing about, the thing about a, a Broadway show is, it keeps you from doing anything else. You have to be there eight times a week. So now that I'm free, I have all of the people are asking me to do things and right. it's lovely. Yeah, not, not only does it ask you to do it eight times a week, but your day is spent getting ready to do it. Yeah, so ex exactly. During the day, really, it's tough. Exactly. Um, so you're talking about doing this, all these films you're doing now. So you are a very dynamic actor. You're, you're physical, you've got, you know, the voice. I think people can hear you have a pretty dynamic voice. Um, you, you are a, a big sized actor on stage. You fill a bigger, a big stage. What's the difference when you then scale down? What do you have to do? Are there things you have to remind yourself about when you transition to doing a film or television? How is it different? Um, well, hopefully, the only, th the only difference is you don't, have to project anything, um, and 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 whatever choice you make physically, you you can communicate a great deal. If if you imagine, for example, that you're fa if you're a stage actor, this is what I tell my students when I'm teaching film acting. It's like Im imagine that if you if you've primarily worked on stage and you've got let's say a 30 foot proscenium 30 by 60 proscenium let's say what you have to imagine is that your face now fills that entire proscenium so if you move your eyebrow that's like you you've moved you've made an enormous movement within that frame right um and 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 that communicates something so um if you're a person who naturally has an extremely mobile face, um, as some of my students do, then they have to learn to sort of calm that, those muscles down. But that's good anyway, because on film, you, you need a kind of a, you need a kind of a cool center. 
you need a kind of a relaxation is enormously it's enormously important on on stage as well but it's even more important on film so that's really the only difference except with the um <laughs> there's a, a fallacy which is that somehow film acting is more realistic than stage acting and actually precisely the opposite is true um, i've always found as well yeah yes yeah, on film you're frequently asked to pretend, for example, you'll be across the room from somebody and you can't hear them at all. And you have to pretend that you can hear them and then you speak in a voice that they can't hear and you're each pretending to hear the other, but neither can hear it. So um, on a stage, you're actually, you know, with the other person in space and hopefully playing truthfully with them. Uh, There's and, also 18 people standing around you in close right. proximity that's, while you're doing it. So. That's right. That's the other thing. And then you're, you, there, you also have some awareness of where the camera is, which you're including in your work. And if you don't, if you don't do that, you're going to have the cameraman come over and tap you on the shoulder and say, you know, can you open up a little this direction? I'm over here, you know. And um, I think the fallacy is that you know, you, they just turn the camera on and you just behave. But that's maybe somebody, maybe Brando can do that, you know, because he's Brando and they're going to accommodate him. But if you're a guest artist on Elementary, you're not Brando. You know, you they, you, you, you got to accommodate them, not the other way around. Right. So, Patrick, you're an actor, you're a teacher, <clears throat> you're a director, but you're also a playwright. Would you talk a little bit about that and, and what... Well, you've written a couple of plays, right? I have written a couple of plays. I, 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 uh, I wouldn't call myself a playwright. I, um, I took up writing plays as a way of understanding structure and understanding playwrights better. Um, and and it, very, very valuable for me in that, in that way. Um, and it's been helpful for me when I've been in the process of, of making a show from the bottom up, which I've done a lot, where I've been in with the writer and the director and the dramaturg in the room. And I, I think my contributions can be a little better informed because I've, 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 I've tried to write things on occasion. Um, uh, I'm, I'm writing something right now that is, you, you, you know, I mean, I, I think understanding structure, I'm also teaching right now, I teach a class called Learning Lear once a week. And I have 70 students. And one of the things that I'm trying to show them is the, is the architecture of the play, the structure of it, um, and, and how the themes are woven through the play. Um, and so trying to write something myself, writing something, having it performed, watching how actors wrestle with it, you know, when you write bad exposition and the actor has to, has to struggle to try to make it sound real. And you can't, as a writer, figure out a way to put it in the actor's mouths in a more natural way. It gives you a lot of empathy for playwrights, you know. So do you have a Lear in you? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, I played Lear when I was 22 years old, but when it was my college thesis role. And I've been obsessed with it ever since. And I've been offered it a couple of times, turned it down. But I think now, if it was the right director in the right theater, I would say is a good time. I'm 58. I think you should play him first when you're in your mid to late 50s. Um, I, I do find that, you know, you. I, I thought Colin Fior, for example, who was around my age, just a couple of years older, did a brilliant Lear at Stratford. And part of it was because he was young and healthy enough to really have the stamina, do, stamina. Yeah, have the stamina to do it. Yeah. There are 11, 11 scenes and they're all yeah. Titanic. You know, you don't get to rest in any of them. My dad did it at 78 and yeah. it was too late. I mean, yeah. there were moments of greatness in it. The, the Heath scene was fantastic. But he lost his way because he didn't have the energy and stamina anymore to be able yeah. to really do it. How he could have done it 10 years or 15 years earlier. Yeah. And I do think, frankly, I mean, I, I'm sure I'll, I will disavow this when I can no longer do it. But I, I think the image of the cruciform of Lear 
holding Cordelia, entering with Cordelia in his arms, is an important archetype. And when, when that has to be... Um, Justice. Yeah, when, that, when it, that has to be adjusted in some way, I, I, it always makes me a bit sad. So um, you were talking about when you were 22 in college and you grew up in Oregon, right? I did, did you up yeah. In yeah. Portland or outside? Uh, it's Salem, near Salem, the capital Salem, city in the Willamette yeah. Valley. Right, so a, a smaller, smaller town, right? Uh, almost rural. Very, very little town, right. rural, yeah. So when you look back on now being a Tony-nominated actor who stars on Broadway and the path you've taken, what do you think when you look at it? Well, I, you know, I think when a, when a play is really good, for me, the final scenes of the play will seem both surprising and inevitable. And that's how I feel about my journey. It, it feels to me both surprising and inevitable simultaneously. I always knew I was going to do this. I always knew where and how. I'm surprised by it. Um, and uh, I'm surprised by some of the turns it's taken. I don't, I don't think I expected it all to be involved in musicals the way I am, for example. I think as my career turns more and more now into television and film, I don't think I really envisioned that. I think I, I kind of envisioned that I would maybe get a job in Ashland and stay there for the rest of my life, you know. Um, but what I found is that I just, I got restless. And um, I liked, I, li I, I needed more uncertainty in my life than that. Um, and more surprises. And the thing about living in New York for me is the surprises, they just keep coming. You'll be sitting one day and you have absolutely no idea what you're gonna do and then you get a phone call and suddenly your next year is all lined up for you or your next several months or, and, and this, it's the, 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 the constant surprises of, of living here. Um, last year or the year before I, I worked at the national theater on the Olivier stage. I was, I, I was, I got to uh, play on the Olivier stage for five months and that was. What did you do uh, there? We did Hades Town there. Oh, okay. And that that for me was, uh, you know, I, I read Peter Hall's diaries when I was fifteen years old, and I and I pictured that, and I pictured Paul Schofield and 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 Peter O'Toole and Anthony Hopkins on the on that stage, and and to be there, and I was in my dressing room, which was Dennis Quilly's dressing room. And I, I used to love Dennis Quilly in, in uh, Long Day's Journey into Night with Olivier and, and, and the, all the dressing rooms face one another at the National. So you can see everybody else's dressing room around the quad. And that was a dream come true. So when you, I think when, you, when something like that happens, because you've imagined it so completely, in three dimensions and kinesthetically even, um, I think there's some part of it that feels inevitable, but it's absolutely surprising and, and thrilling that it's happening at the same time, you know? That's great. Well, I'm going to hope that you are in uh, act three, scene four, and you've got a packed, dense act four to come, and then an amazing act five. So that's Thank where you. I'm going to put you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this today, Patrick. It's great to see you this way at least, because I haven't seen you in person in a long time. So you seem well and in good spirits, and that makes me happy. I'm glad, I'm glad the theater is nourishing your soul and your life. Thank so, you very much. It's great to see you. You too. Take okay. care. Okay, bye-bye.